The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. Open your Bibles to the book of Hebrews. Look at verses 1 through 7. Uh, what we have been studying under the New Covenant, uh, this series under the New Covenant, what we've been looking at is the superiority of the New Covenant over the Old Covenant. And we have looked at that from chapters 8, 9, and 10. And now we're in 10. We're in the final chapter on this subject uh, according to the book of Hebrews. Now, he, the book of Hebrews has been, been running this They've talked about the superiority, superiority of Christ until we got to the seventh chapter. And from the eighth, eighth, ninth, and tenth, they've talked about the superiority of the new covenant that he's brought in. And uh, so we've been focused on the new covenant that Christ came in with. And um, if, you, if you have a study Bible, uh, uh, or, or whatever, you will notice like from verse 5, verse 5, he gets into this thing in verse 5, we, we, he's going to go through uh, what the scripture says. And he's going to go to Psalms 40, 6 through 8, and he's going to show you that that was messianic, that this is about Christ. Uh and so I'm going to, even though my study is only going to be a few verses of this, I want to look through the, through verse, read through verse 7. For the law, the Mosaic law, and notice that's a capital L, since it has only, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the very form or substance. And the shadow has to have a substance, Right? I mean, something that it's casting. A good thing to come, the shadow, it's a shadow of the good things to come. Can never by the same sacrifice, year by year, which they offer continually, those under the old covenant, can make perfect the sacrifices year by year, which offer continually, can never, watch this, can never make perfect those who draw near. Can't make perfect. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered because the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have had consciousness of sins. They, they came back year by year by year because of the consciousness of sin hadn't been permanently cleansed. And it's not permanently, wasn't permanently cleansed because it wouldn't be permanently or completed until the Messiah came and did it. You know, I, he said, I've, I've come to fulfill it. But in those sacrifices, shadow Christology, in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year by year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when he comes into the world... And he quotes a Messianic Psalms 40, verses 6 through 8. Sacrifices and offerings thou hast not desired, but a body thou hast prepared for me. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the roll of the book it is written of me, I have come to do thy will. Oh God. And then he goes on to explain that, which we will do the next time. But he goes on to explain that. And so the sacrifices and the old under the old covenant, shadow Christology, was to point us to the coming of Christ who would complete it, who would finish the redemptive program of God, is what they're talking about. He would complete the redemptive program of God. And when he came and died on the cross, he completed the redemptive program, 
which completed everything that had been started under the old covenant has now been completed and everything beyond the new covenant, which is a completion of the old covenant, everything beyond that is covered, right? And so it's a really, it's a really interesting, the writer here has really gone into this in a most unique way. And so what chapter 10 tells us, I wrote on your paper, what chapter 10 tells us is it explains the old, the old covenant shadow Christology was never uh, adequate to complete the Jewish age believer's salvation. You understand that? Salvation until Christ would come and then it would be completed. Now, their names are, their names are registered in the book of life because they believed in the prophetic gospel of Jesus Christ, that one day he would come and bring their salvation to completion. I mean, we look, listen, you don't pay attention to it, but we look at the same thing with the resurrection. Listen, Ephesians 4.30, you know what it says about, about the resurrection? He says, the, on the day of redemption. Look, look, at, look, at, look at that. For, I mean, we're, we're under the same type of program, except ours is completed the moment we believe it. Um, in, uh, let me pull over here. In Ephesians 4.30, um, and, and, you know, this goes with Ephesians, with Ephesians, I mean, Ephesians 4.30, but that goes with the fourth chapter, verses 13 and 14. You know, you're sealed unto the day of redemption, right? This is, we're sealed at the moment of salvation. Do not, because we're under the new covenant, uh, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed. See, that's verse 13 and 14. Look, at, for the day of redemption. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about the resurrection. He's talking about the resurrection. The day, and what's that, that? In other words, we're looking for a completion of our whole system, but it's the whole system of the new covenant. The old covenant looked for Christ coming the first time. We looked for him coming the second time, right? And, and there are big things connected to that both times. So that's what, he, that's what we're talking about. The old covenant looked here and the new covenant looks there. Both of them were looking to Christ. One was looking for his first coming to complete it. We're looking for the second coming to complete it. Why? Because we just read in uh, Hebrews 9.28, when he comes, the second time will be without regard to what? Sin. When he comes back the second time, it is not about sin. That's why he came the first time. It was all about sin. Got that? Well, I mean, the same guy, see, he's, he's building his, his message, isn't he? Chapter 8, chapter 9, now we're in chapter 10. He's building his, so. I like what Weiss, uh, a, a Greek theologian, uh, New Testament, I like what he says in his book on, on words and passages. It, and uh, on page 173, he writes about, about this subject, Weiss does. He says, in view of the fact, and it should be in view of the fact, is not he, it should be the. In view of the fact, that the blood of, of sacrificial animals cannot take away sin, the Messiah, when he became in, incarnate in humanity, perform his priestly work of offering a sacrifice that would pay for sin once for all, did not offer animal sacrifices, but instead offered himself in his physical body begotten through the virgin birth from Mary. And, and maybe that takes us to the chat, Luke 1 and 2 story of the incarnation. And, and, and that, that's a really good evaluation of that, in my opinion. So let's have a word of prayer, and then we're going to talk about the substance is why the shadow is important. The shadow is never of what is important. It's what the shadow is about. And, the, and what the shadow, uh, the shadow of the Old Testament, what, Old Covenant, what it was about was the coming of Christ into the world. And certainly that's happened uh, in, uh, under the new covenant. Well, let's pray. I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest and dwelt by the Holy Spirit, the privilege to confess sin. It is through your priesthood, 1 Peter 2, that you have this privilege to confess your sins. You can do it privately. You can do it personally. You can do it through your priesthood. And it's something that you're responsible for because the Holy Spirit is a great teacher. It's a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't learn it in carnality. You can't apply it in carnality. 
but you can't under the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And that's why we have him. We live in the church age, uh, one, of the, one of the greatest dispensations of all. And uh, so 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sin, he's faithful. And that, that, that if is a third class condition. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. But that's the only way you're going to be spiritual. And how do I know if I'm carnal? Personal sin, mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, avert sins. There's three categories you should examine. If you're aware of any of those, you confess them, and then you're back into fellowship under the ministry of the Holy Spirit, which is essential for Bible study. Father, we're so thankful tonight for these that have come our way by automobile, and by Internet. Pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word of God. I pray, Father, for those who don't understand the principle and that live within driving range, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. If you're capable of doing that, not, not because you're tired, but because you're capable of getting in an automobile and driving here, that's the key. Because of the dynamics in the angelic conflict, the, the dynamics of, of, of what happens within the fellowship, of the body of Christ that meets with one mind and one purpose. I pray for that. But the internet ministry is for those who cannot do it, not those who are too lazy to do it, but those who cannot do it. And so I pray, Father, for the ministry of the, of, that goes from us through the internet to people that they would have the same courtesy and of a code of conduct, I might say, for Bible study and not be distracted and not have phone calls and all those things that distract us from the study of the Word of God. I, I pray for that in this hour. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I, I, what I want to do is I want to take my text. Uh, we're looking at uh, five through, one through seven of my, and I broke it down into five points to kind of show you something that's important for the writer and their S words. My homiletical points have to deal with S words. For example, the key here, he opens up, well, we've been discussing this since chapter eight, but he brings it open. And, and chapter 10, verse one is an enormous passage because it says that the old covenant was shadow Christology. That's where we get the concept in theology of shadow Christology. The, the very first verse for the law, talking about the Mosaic law, capital L, since it, has, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the very substance of itself, see? And that verse is dynamite. Um, of all the verses that you might put down to remember, and remember when you get to chapter 10, if you happen to learn ch chapter 10, verse 1, that that's where shadow Christology taught, then it's chapter 8, 9, and 10 because now he's, make, he's closing this deal out. So he, he's, he's, he's coming to the conclusion of his argument of why the coming of Christ was so important, not just for our salvation, but for a new dispensation and a new covenant period. I mean, this is what he's after. And so he talks about the shadow, the kia, uh, in verse 1, and he says the shadow of the good things, and he uses agathos, and that's one of, agathos is one of those words that identify God. God is good, just like God is light in him, there's no e evil, God is good, and there, there is no bad in him, or there's no wickedness in him, God is good, <clears throat> and uh, when, uh, you remember when the rich young ruler came to Jesus, and Luke, Luke writes about this, he came to him, and, and uh, wanted to know uh, uh, what, what good thing he had to do to inherit eternal life, he came to Jesus, asked him, how he addressed Jesus was really interesting. He called him good teacher, uh, good teacher, good rabbi. Uh, what must I do to inherit the kingdom of God? Uh, and Jesus said to him, are you calling me good? Because he used the word agathos, a divine good. It's, it's a, it was a word of divine good. And Jesus challenged him, are you, are, are you saying, are you, are you, are you, I mean, where did that come from? I mean, what is your source? What's the background for you to call me Agathos good? And then he goes on and has a discussion with him. Um, that's a really, this word good means it's associated with God. So that's, that's kind of an interesting, it's kind of, and that's what he says here. <clears throat> he puts it in the neuter. <clears throat> it's in neuter because it deals, <clears throat> it's dealing with, 
uh, the substance of the shadow. <clears throat> What's the shadow about? You know, I wrote, a, a tree can cast a shadow, but that shadow doesn't tell you what kind of a tree, doesn't tell you what, how it blooms and what the colors are, and doesn't tell you what kind of fruit it produces, right? It's just a shadow. Uh, the be- and, and you may not even know it's a tree if it doesn't have some other similarity to it, you, right? Could be, be, be just. By. Remember when I was in when I was in school and we were going through uh, geometry. One of the things we had to do was to measure the flagpole without climbing it. And it it, it took us a while to figure out that we had to have sunlight and be able to wait till it cast a shadow. <coughs> But I tell you, I've never forgot that class. I never forgot that class. And I thought, boy, that was good because <clears throat> as an old farm boy, if they just said to measure the pole, I'd have climbed up with a maze tapier and, <clears throat> you know, I'd have just shimmied up the post and measured it. <clears throat> I didn't know that the shadow could cast and you could do a, <clears throat> didn't know you could do that deal. <clears throat> I didn't know that. <clears throat> so that was a great class. That was a great class. And so this is what a shadow is. A shadow, you know, a shadow cast is, depends on what it's about. And so he says this, the old covenant was a shadow of Christ. And the good thing about it, it was about Christ. It wasn't about the animals. It wasn't about this. It wasn't about that. It was about Christ. We, so we call this shadow Christology. <laughs> shadow Christology. That's what in theolog- theologians call it. A shadow of the good things to come. Notice things to come. Not the very form or the substance of the things. So this principle is huge in theology. It separates the Old Covenant from the New Covenant. You know what separates the Old Testament from the New Testament? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And you know what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John's about? The coming of Christ. And you know what is established after Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Well, then we have the book of Romans, uh, the Acts, Romans. And you know what that is? That's New Covenant. Here's the Old Covenant. You know what it sets in the middle between the Old Covenant and New Covenant, which begins in Acts and pushes forward in the reality of application? Matthew, Mark, Luke, which is the coming of Christ in the world, going to the cross, paying the supreme sacrifice, boom. If that's not done, if you don't have the last three chapters of all of those Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If you don't have those three chapters, you don't have a new covenant. He's got to go to the cross and die, be buried, and be raised from the dead business. That's that's a pretty powerful idea, and that's what the writer's trying to remind them of. And they call it, listen, here's what they got. They call this the Old Testament, and they call this the New Testament. That's Old Covenant, New Covenant. The truth of the matter is they should have... (laughs) Most theologians always want them to separate Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John from these two ideas because the Old Covenant looked forward to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. When it came, then a whole new period went went off from that called the New Covenant. And so most theologians really make a bigger deal than the average does of the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Most theologians, uh, after they study very long, they separate that. They all separate it. They say Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, this is a key to the, to the division of the Old Covenant from the New Covenant. And they're absolutely right. After you do a little study on it, then everybody comes to that conclusion. Just everybody. I mean, I say everybody, everybody who studies the Bible. The sacrifice, that, that's verse 1. That was the first part of verse 1. The second part of verse 1 is really interesting. The sacrifice, I call it the sacrifice, he says, can never. He says, the shadow can never. See, the shadow can never. We're still in verse 1. And it's a word dunamai. Dunamai. Dunamai is an interesting word because dunamai means able. It means um, it means possible. Are you able? Are you possible? Is it po- Could you possibly help me? And he said, well, I could, but I'm not able. See, and he's talking about the same thing. See, you understand it when he says it, and it's actually the same word. And, uh, and then uh, the idea of power, dunamis, uh, dun- dunamai, dunamis, 
when you, when you call dunamai, the verb dunamis, the noun, that you have the word dynamite. So it's used, it's used a lot with the Holy Spirit. Uh, can never, but look at this word never. Never is a double. Now you don't have, now, when you, listen, they used ote, ote, which is a strong negative. That's ukde. <laughs> That's a double. When they got ukde, they use it as one. That's, that's as high a negative as you can get. And then when you put it with pote, which means at any time. You know what that means? When you put this word, this word is stronger than never. It means never, I mean never at any time ever. That's what that means. It's stronger than never. I mean, if you told somebody never and they go like, what, well, I don't know what you mean by never because they think you, you mean never for a week or I could never drive the car for a week or a day, a day, a week, a month. What's never means, see? So sometimes you have to, this word tells you what, are you talking about, I can't drive for a week, I can't have the car, I can't do this for a month, I can't do that for a year. What, what kind of, this word tells you. It says, not one time, at any time, ever. <laughs> You know what that means? End of discussion. That's what that means, right? May I talk about this again? If we talk about it again, is it because I will talk about it? We ain't ever going to talk about it again unless I bring it up. That's what that means. <laughs> I mean, they went, they went to some links, and we, we translate it never, but it means more than never. It means never, ever, ever, ever. <laughs> Can never... By the same sacrifice, he's talking about the sacrifice, shadow Christology. He's talking about the shadow. He's talking about the old covenant shadow Christology. Can never, by the same sacrifice year by year, which they offered continually, make perfect. This word make perfect, uh, teleo, is a word that means to be complete or finished or come to an end. Can never be completed. The shadow which were the sacrifices, can never, by the same sacrifice year by year, which they offered continually, make perfect those who are worshiping, those who draw near to worship, those who are engaged in the concept of worship through this offering. It's what, he's, what he means by it. So look, listen, look, now don't miss this because it could be a gate question. Never able to do what? All these sacrifices, year after year after year, never able to do what? what? What's the scripture say? Never make you perfect. Never complete you. And what, and what were they offering for? Sin salvation. Right? And, it, and how long will that be? Until Christ comes and completes this whole package. You understand? Listen, when I say the law points you to Christ, what do you think that means? Right? That's all that was, pointing you to Christ. You're, you're, were the salvation completed? Sure. Why did they go back year after year? The next verse is going to tell you because of the consciousness of sin. It's not completed. Why? The scripture tells you it won't be completed. The package won't be complete. Listen, if they died and Christ hadn't come, were they still saved? Of course they were. What's Christ going to do? Fulfill their salvation. You look to the same thing. You're... you're Day of salvation is completed when Christ returns a second time. Did you know that? If you die, you're still saved. Well, what are you looking for? For him to come back a second time. Without regard to what? Sin. Sin. <laughs> Here's the other thing. Sin, the sin consciousness. Otherwise, verse 2 says, otherwise, and that's an ecliptical, second class condition means contrary to fact. Now, you can't even say that. The reason you can't see this is if you had a Greek text, you would see a little A-N someplace, little little A-N. And if you're a Greek guy, you know what that means. Well, this is called an ecliptical second-class condition contrary to fact. And the reason it's called ecliptical is because it's hidden. Right? That's in the English. I mean, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. It means that it's been deliberately hidden. 
It's been deliberate. Now, you can put a second class out there wide open like a first class, second class, and you can see it. This one, the only thing you get to say, and they don't have an apotesis, the only thing you can see is that in the Greek it has a little a-n. Now, for some of us, that's pretty powerful. And for other people, they don't know what this passage means because they don't understand that. But if they kept up with us through chapters 8, 9, and 10, they would have gotten it. Otherwise, now remember, this is contrary to fact. Otherwise, talking about offering, they come every year to offer something that says, I'm looking for Christ to complete my salvation that I believe in. Do you understand that? And so everybody looked for his coming in a year to, for that completion. Kind of like we do with the rapture and all that business. It's a completed deal, right? All right. I just want you to understand. We're not talking about losing salvation and all that foolishness. Quit that. I'm not talking about that. Otherwise, otherwise, remember this is contrary to fact now. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to offer, to be offered? If it could, if it could have made them perfect, why would they go year to year to year to year? Because it didn't, and they knew it. Because the consciousness of sin drove back every year. All right? Because, he says, otherwise, contrary to fact, otherwise would they not have ceased to be offered because the worshiper, having once been cleansed, would no longer have consciousness of, this, of sin as a need to be saved, is what he's talking about. They come back year after year with a consciousness of sin, not because they're not saved, but they're look, they, there's a consciousness of sin that only Christ can complete when he comes finally. And that's what he's talking about. You see, they come back. Contra otherwise, contrary to fact, would they not have done this? Well, yes, but they didn't. They came back year after year after year. Why did they do it year after year? And why did that continue passed on for 2,000 years, right? These people did this for 2,000 years. They never broke stride on this principle. They never broke stride. This was built into their whole religious structure, and it was all about the coming of Christ. When Christ would come, then this whole system would be fulfilled and shut down because Christ would be here. You understand that? Well, I'm just telling you what it is. It's up to you to figure figure what I, what this. So what were they doing? They were looking for Christ to come to complete their package of salvation, just like you are. I mean, are you saved? Of course. Until when? To when Christ comes, as far as far as a historical point, right? And when He comes, it won't be regard to sin because that's why He came the first time. See, that's what the writer's saying. And he said it in ninth chapter. Now he's explaining it. Right, right. Yeah, he's looking because he's got because what he's going to do is complete the salvation package, the package that God designed in eternity past. And so what we have in verses three and four, we have a sin reminder under the old covenant. But in those sacrifices, the writer says, but in those sacrifices, there is a reminder. You know what a reminder is? It is the word of God touching your consciousness of responsibility. A reminder, right? We tell everybody, you know, sometimes we'll put it on a paper. Sometimes, you know, we used to say, I'm going to tie a string to your finger uh, that you might remember, right? A, a reminder. The, the, the shadow Christology was a reminder, and it was a reminder for one thing. It is impossible. It is impossible. This is the same word in another form as dunamai with an alpha privative in the Greek on the front of it. What was possible, dunamai, possible, remember that? Can, never. That's the word can. He put a negative on the front. Therefore, what was possible is now Impossible. That's the word. See, he used the word possible. Then he put it down here, impossible. He says, for it is impossible for the blood of goats and 
bulls and goats, that's under the law, to take away sins. That was only to show you that Christ would come and do that. Okay? And so they look for him. Listen, every generation looked for him to come. They looked for it for 2,000 years, and they gave up and set up a new system. So when he came, they rejected him. He came unto his own. John, the first chapter, verse 11, three, he came unto his own. And what, the, what did his own do? Re rejected him. But to those who received him, to all who received him, right, became sons of God. So the writer said it's impossible under uh, what was under the old covenant to take away sin. So because... It was never intended. It was intended to show you that Christ would come and do that. And when he did, that was completed. It was completed forever. Christ dies one death on one cross on one day, and, and the whole sin issue and salvation issue is completed. And so Christ, they're looking for Christ to come to establish a new covenant, Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. Now he says in the, in the final verse 5, and then he gets into this whole uh, uh, Psalms. He says, therefore, which is interesting. Now, uh, usually when we see therefore, it, it is the Greek word un. And it, un means that this is a trailer hitch. Uh, therefore, why for? That's not this one. This is not therefore, why for? Because this is not that word. This is the word deo. D-I-O. And, it, and that's a compound word that means because of this. Because of this. What's he talking about? Every, listen, verse 1, 2, 3, and 4 is what he's talking about. Because of verse 1, 2, 3, and 4, which is the shadow, the sacrifice, the sin consciousness, and the sin reminder, you need a Savior. Therefore, or because of this, when he comes, he's talking about Christ. When he comes into the world, right, then he's going to complete this whole deal because he's the substance of the shadow. Listen to me. This is why you come to Bible study for somebody to lay this out for you to study it so you don't read it and skip it. See, the average person, if they, first of all, they wouldn't even read it. They'd look at it and go like, I don't know, that's a bunch of Old Testament gobbledygook. I'm not, I don't care. And then the, if they started to read it, I said, well, I'll study it a little bit. They would just get confused like everything. The average person. That's why God gifted certain people to have the gift of teacher because they're driven to understand it. They don't pass over words they don't understand. They don't pass over concepts they don't understand. They're driven to understand it. Then they're driven to understand it in such a way to communicate it to people who don't understand it. And you're a good example of that, and I'm a good example of that, because when I read it, I go like, I don't understand that. And you go, well, let's, let's pay attention. Let's, let's crank it out. Let's study it. Let's break it down. Let's dissect. Let's look at it, because you've got to go to church and explain this to people who go like, I don't understand that. And so, that's exactly what my life is all about. That's my, that's my whole life. Now, I want to show you a passage that will help you a little bit. Let's go to Galatians. About how people were saved. How were people saved, Ron? In the Old Testament. And so, Paul explains it in Galatians, the third chapter. Galatians, my Bible just keeps skipping over that thing. Galatians, the third chapter, Luna, verse 8. Does this give you an example of how people were saved in the Old Testament? <clears throat> this is a cliff note version of what I just gave you. In verse 8, And the scriptures, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preach the gospel... Beforehand, Now, we know what the gospel is. Paul laid it out in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. According to the scripture, Christ has got to die for our sins, be buried and raised from the dead, according to the scriptures, right? That's what he's talking about. But you notice what he calls it now? From the New Testament, he calls 
what they call the coming of Christ. He now calls that the gospel. He now calls it Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Do you understand that? He uses a word gospel that takes all of what I'm teaching you in the book of Hebrews into account all in one little word. He called it the gospel. And when Abraham believed it, it was the prophetic gospel, which all Jews believed they got saved. If they got saved, that's what they believed. But here it says in verse 8, preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, all the nations shall be blessed in you. The you is Christ. The you is not Abraham. The you is in the promise that God gave to Abraham. He gave him three things. He gave him the promise of the land, the promise of the seed of Christ, and the blessings that come with it. You say to me, how do you know that the you is Christ? Look at verse 16. Look at verse 16. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say and to seeds as referring to many, like all Jews, but rather to one and to your seed, that is Christ. You understand? And here's my point. You don't read one verse and take it out of context and come up with your own opinion. You keep it in context and see if the writer has answered the questions that you have. And he did, right? He just doubled up. He put eight and doubled up to 16 and gave it to you. But you didn't get it in eight unless you looked at 16 and said, well, what is the you? The you that was given to Abraham, and the, that's the Abrahamic covenant, was Christ. And it's always been Christ. It's never been a law. The law cannot save you. It points you to Christ who can save you. The law can never save you. The law was never intended to save you. Galatians, the third chapter, verse 24. See that? So there you are. So it, it, the Bible doesn't give you something in one verse and taken away in another. You've got to be students of the word, though. You can't just carry a Bible and have it in the place so it looks like somebody, if the pastor happened to come by, you've got a Bible setting out someplace. Okay? You don't have to worry that. I'm not going to do that. But you can put your Bible wherever you want it. Point number two. The coming of Christ into the world, th this is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The coming of Christ, boy, it is warm in here. Is it just me or is it warm? Oh, Fran's over here going, we know what she's, what she's doing, but she's, she's cold. I must be going through them because I'm, hot, I'm having hot flashes up here. Is it, is it warm? Yeah. When we remember that. Uh, uh, do you know, who, is it Chris upstairs tonight or John? Chris. Chris, be sure to, uh, make, don't worry about Chris, I'll take care of it. The coming of Christ in the world brought the completion of the salvation plan of God. It's the so, salvation plan of God. When he comes in the world, the salvation plan of God that everybody's been looking to has been completed. That's what he's talking about. It was completed when Christ died on the cross for the sins of the world, was buried and raised on from the dead on the third day. That's called the gospel. And that's, listen to me. Boy, if you get nothing else from, from my ministry in your life, know that you must believe that in order to be saved to go to heaven. I want everybody in this room to go to heaven. If you think you're going another way, you're wrong. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one, no one, I don't care who you are, going to get to heaven apart from me. Listen, don't let the devil lie to you because he's going to hell and he wants you there with him. Don't, don't let him lie to you. Uh, 1 John uh, 2, 2 says, and he himself, or he alone, is the propitiation for our sins. In other words, he carried God's wrath, the wrath, the judgment for our sins, and not only ours, but those of the... Now, listen to me. You have no idea how important this phrase is, the world. The Jews neglected their message to the world through Christ. They got all caught up in the law, left Christ. Christ was always intended to be the Savior of the world. Always. Always intended to be the Savior of the world. They've closed down. Now listen, they've closed down. They've got a little uh, uh, exclusive religion because that's what you have without Christ. Well, listen, 
Christ makes you, listen, the prophecy of Christ was get saved and take the message to the world. I just read that. You missed it. You, we read it and it just went <clears throat> apparently over your head. What did he tell Abraham? He said the gospel is not only for the Jew but for the Gentile. Did he not say that? Yes. And that is what they considered the world. And listen, you know how the world is divided? It's divided up into nations. Therefore, in Matthew 28, 18 through 10, Jesus, before he leaves earth, tells the church, tells his believers, carry the gospel message to where? All to all the nations of the world. Carry him to all the nations of the world. That's always been the message. Jews refused to do it. When he tried to get Jonah to take the message of Christ to Nineveh, he went, no way, Jose. That was typical thinking. And listen, that trip meant nothing to Israel over the history of their life. You would have thought that trip would have said, listen, when God tells you to take the message to the Gentiles, you better take it to the Gentiles. Nobody, nobody was willing to do that. Not until after Pentecost. I mean, they were like the woman at the well. What do, I, what, what do I have, Samaritan, what do I have to do with the Jews? The Jews felt the same way. Don't have anything to do with that Samaritan. Don't have anything to do with that Gentile. Don't have anything to do with that person. Don't have to do yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen, and that should not be the way we live as Christians. Under the new covenant, Christ brings equality to every person that believes the gospel. They enter into equality in Christ. We are one in Christ. Listen, here's what the writer is trying to tell us. Here's what he's trying to tell us. He told us in the ninth chapter, nor was it that he should suffer himself often as the high priest entered the holy place year by year with the blood that's not his own. Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world, talking about Christ, but now at the consummation of the age. I pounded that about his heart, and that's a big deal. And notice it's made up of two words, means to bring to completion. Suntelia. That, suntelia, telia means complete. Soon means together. To bring all things together in the consummation is to bring all the prophetic things of Christ into one hub of information. We call that the New Covenant. We call that the New Testament teaching. Uh, ages. He has been manifested. In the consummation of the ages, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and forward, he has been manifest to put away the sin by the sacrifice of himself. This means that one trip to the cross did away with the yearly trips to the temple. Right? His one trip to the cross did away with yearly trips to the temple. And to make sure they understood that, God, when he, when he died on the cross, God ripped the, the veil of the temple from top to bottom, and shut down the system. Did he not? Yes. Well, if you know anything about this, you do. If you go here in church, you know it. If you spend a year with me. In, in the 8th chapter, verse 7 of Hebrews, for if that first covenant had been faultless and it wasn't, there would have been no occasion sought for a second, but there was. Shadow Christology of the law provided a yearly reminder of sin not sufficiently atoned for by past sacrifices, but with the expectation of the coming of the completion of redemption with Christ. In other words, it had a two point, points to it. One is it's not sufficient until Christ. It's not complete until Christ comes. They knew that. They believed that. Under the law, sin was re uh, reminded every year, but not remitted. Now listen to me. It was reminded every year they went, to, they went to sacrifice. It was a reminder that Christ has come. Therefore, sin has not been remitted. And therefore, they came every year, right? Remembering a reminder that it hadn't been completely taken care of. It wouldn't be until Christ came. Does it mean that these people were saved and if they died? They were, of course, they believed the gospel. But the gospel, theirs was shadow Christology, a prophetic, prophetic gospel connected with shadow Christology. The blood of, listen, did the blood of goats and, 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 and bulls 
cleanse their, cleanses them from their sins? I'm not asking your opinion. The Bible said no. I just read it. It's, in, it's, it's there. That's what he, he just got through saying that in, in Hebrews 10. Listen, when you study the Bible, you've got to have an open mind with it. If, you, if, you, if you've already got your mind made up on other ideas, this is a lost cause. You might as well stay home and watch television. When you come to, this, when you come to Bible study, you've got to have an open mind about some things. You've got, you got to be open about the possibility that, that you, maybe you've, you've thought some things the wrong way. We certainly got to come with an open mind. We call that positive volition to truth. Listen, you're, all your life, I'm that way. You, you, you can't read something and think you know what it means until you've studied it. Because then, then you're, 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 you're trying to read the shadow and rather than the substance. Listen, the Word of God to tell you the truth. Whew, I'm getting warm. I gotta quit this stuff. Listen, he said it's impossible. Listen to me. He, he, Hebrews 10.4, it is impossible. Remember, I, I wrote the word on the board right there. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats by the law, this is by the law, to take away sins. It always was that Christ would take away your sins, and when he come, that would be completed. You don't have to go to, listen, you mean you have to go to the cross every time it's preached, you have to go to the cross to get saved? No, that's law. Law, you went to the temple every year to get, right? Not to get saved, but because you were saved. I know people, listen. You don't have to do that anymore. You should go to church and know that you're, you're saved. If you die, you're going to go to heaven. You're not looking for Christ to come back in regard to sin. You're looking for Christ to come back in regard to the whole redemptive program being wrapped up. Don't, don't listen to people lie to you like that. Read the Bible and take it for what's word. For by the one offering, he, Christ, has perfected or completed or finished. You know what he said on the cross? You know how he closed out his whole cross experience? Finished. For it's finished. Right? It is finished. You know what the word is? Same word as used here. It's word completed. It's the same word. It's put into perfect tense. Same word. He said, it's finally done, Father. That which was from the sin of Adam has finally, this whole program has finally been completed. See, that was a gift to God. That was the gift of his salvation to God. When he said, this was, he said to God, because people still don't know, they think they're not saved, yeah, 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 yeah. That's a gift to God when he said it's finished. He said to God, I've completed the task sent for here. Redemption is completed. Do you, you realize what, what a joy that was? That's who he spoke that word, word to, and we'll be wise. We would understand what he said back. It is finished, Father. It is finished. What a wonderful, what a wonderful thing. That's what, that's what he said in John 19.30. See, I just read John, John 10.14 to you. We, listen, John 10.14 answered the, John 1.10.1. 1, 1. Now, you're not down to 14, but it answered 14. What did he say in 14? For by one offering, he, Christ, perfected for all times those who were sanctified. That answers that whole deal of, of, of verses 1, 2, and 3, and 4. So Christ also have been offered uh, once to bear the sin of many will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin. See, th that puts a whole new look on the word salvation because the word soteria actually means deliverance or rescue. Okay? And it won't be, it won't be about sin. And I talked about that the other night. Then in Galatians, the equality of one in Christ. Listen to this. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. You know, when we say that, Listen, we're not talking about Christ anymore. We're talking about Christ Jesus. You know what that is? That's the humanity. Jesus, Christ is the prophetic name. Jesus is the humanity name. That's the incarnation name. We will call his name Jesus. You know why? Because he will save his people from their sins. And then when we attach the Lord to it, it's because he was raised from the dead and sent it back to the Father. He's the Lord Jesus Christ. Now you understand why he's Christ Jesus the Lord. I mean, he earned these titles, buddy. He earned them. You understand what I mean? 
He fulfilled them. For you are all, all sons of God. All. That word all is important. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who have faith in the gospel. For all of you who were baptized into Christ. Have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male, male nor female. How is that possible? Because how is that possible? Because that's who, all, 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 who we all are. We are neither black nor white. We are neither this or that, right? The answer is right here. For you are all one in Christ. Hoo-ah. And that tears away all these, all these prejudices and separations of, of us. This is not what the church, this is what the church should look like. It's exactly what the church should look like. Whether it does or not, that's another issue. When we do the Eucharist, and I close with this, when we do the Eucharist, this is what it means to be saved under the new covenant. When we do the cup of the Eucharist, we say this this is the new covenant in my blood, lifting the cup. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you do it. What? Remember, it's the same word that they had in the Old Testament. Do you understand it? Same, same word. And wh where's our remembers come from? C comes back to Christ. Just like theirs was pointed to Christ, ours points back to Christ. Do you understand that? I mean, that's the privilege we have. I mean, we're highly privileged people whether you understand it or not. But as we go along in this, hopefully, hopefully we'll get a better feel of, 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 listen, we're new covenant people. I don't know how many people don't know that. You would be amazed how many people think they're still under the law, still think they're under the old covenant. And it takes away the joy of the journey of the, of the new covenant. Uh, let's have a word of prayer, and I'll dismiss those who have visited with us today. Father, we're thankful for these that have come our way by automobile and by Internet. And we, we press people to become students of the Scriptures. Study it out under the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He will reveal truth to you. He is the great teacher of truth. Truth is what we seek. You don't take my word for it. You take the word of God for it. You take the word of God for it. Study the scriptures. Study what, I, study what I teach. Learn the languages. You can learn them. If you say, well, how does he know that that's that and this is that? I, I'm not giving you anything that a first-year Greek student that studied could learn. Learn it. Find out for yourself what is the reality of the truth of the word of God and embrace it and believe it. Live it for the joy that it's intended to bring to your life. Get out from under the bondage of the law. Embrace the grace of God. Embrace it. Get out of the law and bondage. And get into the grace and joy, and peace. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us.